Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. It's, it's a lovely day, and especially after yesterday. Um, so uh, I'm most grateful for you to sacrificing lovely sunshine to come and sit and listen to me. And this, um, this talk actually began life as a conversation I had a few months ago with uh, Claudia Zeiske, who's the director of Deveron Arts, which is a, a, a local arts-based organization in the town of Huntley in Aberdeenshire. And she was planning an event to celebrate the planting of a new woodland. And she wanted me to talk about the principles of sustainability as they bear on friendship and peace, on grassroots democracy, on art, ecology, and culture. You mean you want me to talk about the sustainability of everything, I said. Well, and it seemed to be a pretty impossible thing to do. But the more I thought about it, the more it seemed to me that sustainability is either of everything or it is nothing. Because it can't be of some things and not others. It can't be a sustainability that has boundaries of inclusion and exclusion. As they will say, well, we'll sustain some things, but it doesn't matter if we throw away the others. So the questions it, it left me with are, are, are threefold. The first is, what kind of a world has a place for us and for everything else, both now and for future generations? Then secondly, what does it mean for such a world to carry on? Because I think that's what sustainability is about, carrying on. And thirdly, of course, how can we make it happen? And to answer these questions, I think we have to take a closer look at the meanings of our two key words, that is, sustainability and everything. And I'm afraid being an academic, um, I'm obsessed with the meanings of words, as all academics are. But I happen to think, actually, that words are terribly important. And it is important to be clear about their meanings, because we can't have sensible debate about things like sustainability unless we have some clarity on what we're talking about. So in a way, I apologize, but don't apologize for putting a lot of emphasis on the meanings of words. They are important. So I want to start with everything, which is one of those words we use all the time, but often don't think about very much what it means. You might ask, how many things make everything? And how can we count them up? And how can we be sure that nothing has been left out? So we could start, for example, with all the people in this room. We could do a head count. I won't start now. We could, we could do a head count and make sure that we've got everybody. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so on. And could then end up with maybe 25 or 30 or whatever it is. So we've got a, the plural as a sort of multiple of the singular. So many individuals. I can count. There's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. I can see each of you is an individual human being. And I, can, I could, if I was so inclined, tell you exactly how many people there are in this room. Now, scientists who work with data always want to count things. We're in a world that is absolutely overwhelmed with statistics. And when anybody wants evidence-based discussion about anything, the evidence always turns out to be of figures of one kind and another. We are obsessed with counting things. So the sustainability of scientists and of the policy makers that base their decisions on scientific material, scientific data, theirs is sustainability by numbers. And yet the fact is that some things are difficult, if not impossible, to count. I mean, fairly obvious. It's very hard to count clouds in the sky. It's very hard to count eddies in a stream. It's very hard to count trees in the woods. And it's very hard to count fungi on the forest floor. And you think, why are these things, we all know that they're just about impossible to count, but why are they so difficult to count? Well, it's partly because with these things you never know where one ends and another begins, and partly because they never stay still. So you start trying to count clouds, even on the kind of day where 
there are some relatively distinct clouds, I and mean, most, most days there aren't, but some days you can say, well, there's a cloud here and there's a cloud there. So you could start try, trying to count them, but the clouds just are always forming and dissolving. They sometimes appear to merge and at other times to break up. So by the time you finish your count, you find that the sky's all changed and there are more clouds or less clouds than when you started with. Eddies in the stream come and go. And the thing about eddies is you can't actually say what is on the inside of an eddy or what is on the outside of it because it's actually the form of a movement. As for trees, try counting trees, how can you possibly tell where the tree ends and the rest of the world begins? And you, how can you count trees unless you know that? Take a tree, I mean, where, where, where is the end of a tree? Or what do we include in the tree and what do we leave out? For example, if you pick off a bit of bark of the tree, you'll likely find that it's inhabited by some small bark-boring beetles that live there. Well, are the beetles part of the tree or are they not? And then you think, well, there's actually a nest in the tree. So, well, the bird built it, but is the nest part of the tree or not? And if you say, well, actually, in a way, the nest is part of the tree, then, well, what about the bird? Maybe it's part of the tree too. And what about the wind that has shaped the tree in the way it has, so that it's a bit bending over this way with more branches on one side, not on the other. The sun has affected its growth because, again, it's growing more on the south side than the north side. So perhaps after a while you begin to think that the tree is not this object. You can say, well, here's the tree, and outside there's not tree. But the tree is a sort of a knot, a focus, a place where things are going on, which extends out into the world for as far as you'd like to take it. It could extend out to the beetles, to the birds, to the tree, to the, to the sun, to the wind, and so on. And then, what about fungi? I mean, the interesting thing about fungi is what we see are uh, the, the fruiting bodies. They're the things that pop up above the ground, but below ground is the fungal mycelium, which is a great network of fibers that can stretch for acres and acres and last for hundreds of years. Uh, and we don't see it. It's a bit like, fungi are a bit like street lamps in the city. We, we see the lamp sticking up above the pavement, but we don't see all the circuit, circuitry underneath. So you might count so many fungi sticking up above the ground in some area, but um, you have no idea how many fungi you've actually got because they're all connected up underground with the mycelium. Well, if clouds, eddies, trees and fungi are hard to count, then what about people? We think it's easy to count people but that's because we think of each person as a bounded individual, as though you're inside your skin. Suppose you had there's some sorts of photography where you can, you can actually register on the, on the photographic plate the movement of air when you breathe in and out. And of course, when you breathe the air in, it really becomes part of you. It's right inside there and you breathe it out again. And, and if you think of us as aerial beings breathing in and out, then actually, we're all intermingling here in the air we're breathing. The air that I'm breathing is the air that you've breathed and we're all, it's all circulating around uh, in, in this room. And then you'd find that, that what we think to be people are not discrete units at all, but completely sort of mixed up with one another in some kind of interpersonal soup. So what if you were to think of a person as something like an eddy in a stream? or as something like a fungal mycelium, as a circulation, or perhaps a bundle of, of lines of one sort and another. And if that sounds a bit odd, well, there are plenty of people around the world who usually think like that. And one example that I, I happen to know about are the indigenous people of the high Arctic in Greenland, Arctic Canada. Um, we, uh, the, these people, uh, know them, well, a, a, a singular person among these people is known as Inuk, which sort of roughly translates as soul. So as you say, there's a soul, that's Inuk. And the, the, in, in the language, the plural of Inuk is Inuit. And we know the Inuit people 
used to be known as Eskimo, the populations of these northern regions. We call them Inuit. And we might talk gaily about our Inuit populations and say, well, there's so many thousand people living in Greenland and so many thousand people living in Canada. Those are the Inuit. I mean, so we could count them up, just like I tried counting up the people in this room. But that's not actually how it is for the Inuit themselves. The plural of Inu Inuk is Inuit, but plural for them doesn't mean a countable number of individuals. Usually the plural form comes after a place marker of some kind. So you get um, Netsilik, which is a, p a person um, of that particular region, Netsili, and the plural of that is Netsilingbiut. And what it means is not oh, a, a, a hundred or a thousand or fifty people. What it means is something like soul life going on in and around this place. So that it's, it's, it's not a, a quantity, but a sort of quality, a vital quality that inhabits a particular place that is then has, has its own particular place, maker, place, uh, place name. Well, um, a while back I was, I was reading, or actually rereading uh, a, a work that I like very much um, by the classical Roman author Lucretius called On the Nature of Things. Maybe you know this work. But, uh, but Lucretius uh, whose, whose ideas are sort of completely dismissed as, 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 as sort of um, superstitious nonsense by modern science, um, but actually, I think, hold a key to what we should, do, a, a way of understanding the cosmos that would fit very well with what we know today. Um, Lucretius argued that, that we, we live in a world which, where, where, where there are masses and masses of tiny seeds, tiny particles, that are naturally falling downwards through space in parallel lines. And if that was all there was, if it was just this falling downwards of all these uh, complete uh, raining particles, so all the time falling downwards, there wouldn't be a world, there wouldn't be anything. But the fact is there are things. There are things we see, objects, people, cows, fields, mountains. And, and, and there are things, and there's a world with things in it, because as they fall, some of these particles just swerve a little bit from their course. For whatever reason, this, this particle that's supposed to be coming straight down suddenly goes just a little bit like that. And because of that, it starts bumping into other particles, which bump into other particles, which bump into others. And after a while, you have something like a, a, a cascade of, of collisions and, and eddies, actually, things flowing around. So you can imagine if you started off with... Um, Hang on. That everything's coming down like that, but then suddenly something goes, goes wonky, and and after a while you, you, you've got, you've got you've got something like that, and 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 there are and there are things. That's how, or why, um, there are things in the world because because of because things go a little bit awry, and and. Um, and after a while, it, it causes this, this cascade of, of um, collisions. Uh, and this is what, look. Oh, it's all right. It's very long. <laughs> so, and this is what Lucretius wrote. Herein wonder not how it is that while the seeds of things are all moving forever, the sum yet seems to stand supremely still. So he's wondering, how is it that, that when this, the world is just full of movement, what we see are, are static objects or things. And, 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 and what he said was that what we recognise as, as things, what we recognise as somehow stable, as recognisable objects in the world, are really just the forms of movement. Like as though everything was an eddy. And we see an eddy in the stream and we think, oh, that's a thing. But really, that eddy is just the form of a movement. So, so he's saying that we shouldn't think of things, we shouldn't think of anything, and we shouldn't think of everything as, as a blob, but something like an eddy, that is like the form of a movement. And in, in this world of movement, things are continually emerging, differentiating themselves. 
So it's not as though the clouds in the sky present a sort of anomaly with difficulty because they're hard to count. They actually show the way the world really is continually forming and dissolving. So, and this is this, this way in which things are continually forming and differentiating themselves. This is a question, if you like, of, of splitting rather than cutting. Remember, everything's coming down here and then just going a little bit off and bumping into other things. So it, the, the, the way, the process in which things get formed is a sort of longitudinal process. It's going along with things rather than against them. And, and one, one way to imagine that is to, is, is to suppose that you are, you're splitting timber. You have a length of timber and, um, uh, and, and there would be two ways of, of, of cutting. You might, you might cut the timber into sections across the grain with a saw, or you might split it along the grain with an axe. And imagine you've got, <laughs> imagine that you've got uh, this, this log here, and, and you decide you want to saw it into length. So you, so if, with, from that point of view, the, the timber is just sort of raw material, and you have a, a, a system of fixed intervals which you're going to impose on it. So you've decided, you know, you want to, you want to, to cut a one meter length of, of log, so you take your saw, you cut it there, and you cut it there. So you're imposing a, 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 a system of your own onto the raw material. But if you take the axe and split it longitudinally, it's a bit hard to draw, but something like that, and the axe is going in here, then far from imposing a, uh, a measure of your own upon the timber, you're entering the grain at a particular point and then following a line that was actually incorporated into the timber when it was part of a living tree, because you're following the grain and the axe goes the way the grain takes it. I, th I think it's rather like opening a book at a particular page and then reading on from there. Like you, you put your axe, your skill, so you get your axe in just the point you want to put it. It's like you're going to open the book on page 93 and then read the story on following the line that's, that's in the book uh, rather than imposing, imposing your own uh, line, lines on it. Or for another example, think about what happens when you uh, inscribe a path in the ground or when, when, when in, the, in, the, in the woods um, you, you, you're walking through and, and lots of other people follow the same route and after a while um, you see that a, a path begins to develop made of all these, um, these footprints. It uh, might be a bit hard to see from, places to, from one place to another, but you can see this path snaking, snaking through the woods. And the, the, thing about, the thing about the path is that you can, you can see it there in the ground. So you can see that in, in some sense the path, as people are walking along it, the path is differentiating itself from the ground. So, so you, can, you can see it there and it's, it's, it's saying, you know, here's this path. But the ground is not differentiating itself from the path. The path is differentiating itself from the ground, but the ground is not differentiating itself from the path. It's not as though the ground has sunk back into a sort of flat homogeneity and left the path on top of it. I mean, if, if that's hard to, to grasp, just compare it with what the surveyor does. Um, in, in ancient Egypt, um, uh, where the land had to be resurveyed every year after the annual flooding of the Nile. And, and they, they sent surveyors out and, and measured out the plots of land that different people were going to cultivate. The surveyors were known as, as rope stretchers. Each surveyor carried a rope and, and, a, and a bundle of pegs. So they would uh, knock the peg into the land where the, where the corners of the plots should be, and then they stretched the rope from one peg to another. In rather the same way as today, you know, systematic gardeners will, will put pegs in the ground, uh, run a string from one peg to the other, and then plant their lettuce seeds underneath the string so they get a nice straight line. So the surveyor was a rope stretcher, but in that case, the, uh, the rope was stretched above 
the ground between two pegs. So the pegs were like data points and the rope which is stretched is a connection between those two points. So compare that with what happens when you actually walk the ground and create a path. This is different. In, in one case the line connecting the pegs is quite separate from the ground on which it's drawn just as the line on the map is separate from the paper. But in the other case the path is actually part of the ground although it's also distinguished from the ground in the way that people walk along it. So in a way stakes in the ground are data points, they're stoppages, but the path in the ground is a cumulative trace of movement. And in walking you join with the path rather than joining up its points and that's how walking differs from surveying. Now I, I mentioned this idea of the path because it, it, it's an example of a, a very very general phenomenon which um, is sometimes known as the fold. Um, that one could, uh, uh, so, so to give you another example of, uh, um, you might say that um, that I can, I can make a line in this handkerchief by stretching it like that and forming a crease, okay? And you can recognize the crease, you can recognize the crease line, but the line is still part of the handkerchief. It's not separated from it. And it's just the same way with the, with the path and the ground. And it's actually a bit the same if you imagine a wall. Imagine that you built a wall um, and so you're or as part of a building and you might think of it like this, well here's the ground and, whoops, sorry, here's the ground and here's the wall that I've, I've built on top. There's a, there's a cross section of the wall going, going that way, so it's got bricks on like that. And here's the ground underneath. But then you think, what, what's actually going on down here at the bottom of the wall? Because that there, inside there, you're thinking, well, that's part of the ground in a way, and the bricks themselves um, have, uh, have themselves originally come from materials that have been taken out of the ground. If this was a dry stone wall, it seems even more the case, you know, that the stones are, uh, are stones that belong there in the land. The farmer has, has gathered the stones from around on his field and he's building this dry stone wall, which is just heaped up there. So can you really say that the ground sort of continues underneath the wall and that the wall has been put on top. Or should one rather say that, well, actually, the ground just starts going up very steeply here, goes around and then goes down again. And actually, in building the wall, what's happened is that the ground has sort of risen up into the wall itself. After all, if you were a mountain climber and you think about a mountain, you wouldn't say that the mountain has been stuck on top of the ground. You'd just say that, well, the ground is very steep at this place because I'm climbing the mountain. So, so you wouldn't say, here's a mountain, you know, here's the ground and here's the mountain that you put on top. You would say that, no, uh, the ground goes up and you, you have to climb when it gets rather steep. So maybe it's just the same with the wall. And if you think of the wall like that, you can see how um, the wall is not an object that has been placed on the ground, but it's actually a fold in the ground itself. And that's what's meant by a fold. And then if you think back to those clouds that I mentioned in the beginning, uh, clouds are very difficult things to get a handle on because um, they're, they're often thought of as, as, as objects in the sky. Well, actually, if, if clouds were objects in the sky, then, then air travel would be a rather hazardous um, pr pr procedure. But um, but, and we know that there is this kind of fuzzy stuff that, you, that, that the aeroplane um, happily goes through. Um, but John Ruskin, in his, uh, when he's writing about, um, about the, the, the great masters of landscape painting, um, complained at, at length about the way in which they painted the sky. Because he said he made, it, they, they made the sky look like this perfectly blue dome. Um, with, in which the clouds were sort of hanging like balloons in, inside and you get this feeling that, that after a while 
um, if you imagine yourself going up into the sky, you'd, 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 bump, in to, you'd bump into this, this blue dome. When, of course, in reality, there is no surface there. There's no, there's no, there's no blue dome of the sky that, if we travel far enough, um, we'll find it. And, and clouds are not objects that hang in this blue dome. Or maybe they would be if you were a theatre director and you were trying to uh, create in your, inside your theatre a sort of simulacrum of the sky, then you'd, you'd, you'd be able to paint the top blue and hang some uh, cotton wool or whatever in it to make the clouds. But, or if you were Winnie the Pooh, um, you know, trying to... But that, that's another story. Um, but but, but in, re in real life, the cloud is actually a fold in the sky. It's a moisture-laden fold in the sky. And so we have to think of the sky as a folded crumple, like, like just think of this in three dimensions, all screwed up together. That's, the sky is something like that. It's a, it's a, a complexly folded, involute, three-dimensional surface, if you can imagine such a thing. So all of that then um, leads us to think that that if we're talking about everything, remember I've, I started by asking what, do we, what, what is everything exactly, then perhaps we shouldn't think of everything, I was think, trying to think of two suitable images, we shouldn't think of everything like a bag of sweets, but something like a crumpled rag. The bag of sweets, you know, you've got your bag or your pot and inside there are lots of sweets and you could, you could count them out, but the crumpled rag, everything, you can't count it, but everything is all crumpled up, and, and what you've got are, are, are a very complicated array of, of folds, just like the folds that you've got there. So then it made me think, well, how should we then think about parts and wholes? Because um, we keep talking about the, the world and the, the parts of the world, the part, the whole, and the rest of it. And the first thing I would want to say is that, 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 that we can't possibly think of this whole, the whole world, as a totality. Because that would be supposed that it's all finished, all done, everything added up. We've got everything, it's added up, and there's the world in its totality. But such a world couldn't harbour any life. There'd be nothing going on in it anymore. It would be complete, finished, done with. The world that we inhabit is one that is living, moving, going on, that has a has a time dimension to it. Um, so there's a going on, um, and this lies somehow in 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 the harmony of of its lines of its of the alternation of tension and resolution. So again, I like to think in terms of images, and one image that that I find helpful to think of, and imagining what the what the whole of life might be like. It's something like a, a rope. And, and we know that, that a rope hangs together and doesn't unravel because it's made out of lots of strands, lots of lines, lots of strands, but each strand is twisted in a um, direction contrary to the re direction in which the strands are twisted with one another to form the rope. That's, that's how it is. So if you, if, you if you form each particular strand twisting it this way, then when the strands are twisted together to form the rope, they'll twist that way. And that means that if, if you imagine your one strand trying to unravel, it would only tighten up the rope itself. And if you started thinking of the rope trying to unravel, it would only tighten up the strands. And in fact, the reason why the rope doesn't unravel is because these two, the, the contrary forces, of, of, of tension and friction pull in opposite direction and hold the things in balance. And the, the ancient Greeks called that harmony. I mean, that's where the idea of, of harmony comes from. Uh, it comes from the balance of, of, of forces of, of, of tension and, um, and, and compression that hold things together. And, and when you think about it, that, that principle is very general. If you, if you were to think of, of, for example, the parts of polyphonic music in the chorus or in the string quartet or in the orchestra, that, that, you've, that, that what you've got, in, say, in the chorus, um, the tenor part, the alto part, the soprano part, and so on, are, are carrying on through time alongside one another and continually answering to each other in counterpoint. 
So it, it, rather than thinking of, of parts as something that you would assemble, like, like so I, I, I take this part and these parts and assemble them to form a, an object, which is made up of the, these sections, what you've got is something more like um, this, this, this line that is carrying on along that line and carrying on along that line and so on. And, and the lines continually moving on and as they do so, um, respond to one another. So if, we, if we're talking about the parts and the whole, we should perhaps think of parts in the way we think about the, the um, soprano part in the chorus or the cello part in the symphony, not in terms of um, the parts of, of a construction kit uh, where, you, where you're gluing things together to form um, an assembly of some kind. Well, that so much for so, so much for everything. We've got, now got an idea about what everything is. It's uh, it's a movement. It's uncountable. It's made up of folds, um, and 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 it um, is is carrying on uh, through time. But then the question is: if if you agree that everything is a correspondence of parts in that sense, then what's the meaning of sustainability? What does it mean to talk about sustainability if we imagine a world like that? The, 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 the trouble at the moment is, is, is that um, in most of the rhetoric about sustainability is, is, um, is numerical. It's, uh, it's done in terms of, uh, of data, data counting and statistics. And this numerical calculation, calculus of sustainability, tends to treat entire tracts of the Earth's surface and the resources they harbour as standing reserves for the continuing benefit of a globally distributed humanity, much as one might administer a trust fund for future generations. So to protect the Earth. It, it, in a way, with, in, in, this, in this, this numerical rhetoric of, of sustainability, is to protect the earth in rather the same way that a company protects its profits. And that's not a question of personal care based on familiarity and experience, but of bookkeeping and rational management. That is balancing recruitment and loss in renewables as one might balance monetary income and expenditure. So people are thinking about, well, well you know, the, we, we hold the earth as a trust fund for future generations and therefore we've got to make sure that um, we, uh, we, we don't, that, 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 that we don't take out um, faster than we put back or that we don't take stuff out faster than it's capable of, of renewing itself. So they're thinking in terms of these, this quantitative term uh, of management. But it seems to me that in, in, if, if, if we say that the world is something that is fundamental, like Lucretius, if we say the world is fundamentally given in movement, then, then sustainability is actually about carrying on. It's about keep, keeping things going, not about maintaining some sort of numerical uh, uh, steady state or making sure that you're, you're, you've got a balance of accounts in your books. It's about, about allowing the movement that generates things, that is life, to carry on. So it's somehow about lasting, about making things last. But again, when we talk about making things last, this is not in the sense of a preservation of form, as we tend to do in the museum. In, in the museum, you, you might be a museum curator and you've got these objects to look after, and the thing you're most concerned about is that uh, they should maintain their form for as long as possible, that they shouldn't change, they shouldn't decay, they shouldn't decompose. But, but that's not what lasting means here. We, we, we need to think of lasting in terms, perhaps, of an, in the sense of the life cycle. So if, if you ask, for example, how long does a person last, you wouldn't say, well, how long do, the, do, do, do they seem to stay exactly the same, um, or have they changed? Uh, you would say, um, for example, well, how long did they live? When were they born? When did they die? Okay, they lived for 80 years, 90 years, 55 years, whatever it is. That's how long they lasted. And we're thinking of lasting there in terms of 
the life cycle of a person, not in terms of the preservation of their particular form. We don't put people in museums, uh, we put objects in museums and so on. So if sustainability is really about carrying on, then there's no real, not really any opposition between preservation and change. I give you one other example which I like very much. It comes from a study by, by an anthropologist called John Knight um, who worked with um, uh, foresters in a mountainous region of Japan and was looking at their traditional practices of forestry and then what had happened to them in, in recent decades. And the traditional practice was this, that, that the forester would, would plant and grow and look after trees for a generation, something like 30 years, well, from, from the, from the use of conifers. So you plant the tree, you attend it, you look after it, make sure everything's well with it. And once a suitable period had elapsed, you would cut it down. And then having cut it down, you'd use those trees to make timbers for your house. And, and then the, the, so during the first 30 years of the growth of the tree, you're looking after the tree. In the next 30 years, the tree has become a house timber and it's looking after you, you and your family living inside the house. And they call this the second life of trees. So the first life is when the tree is growing in the ground and, when, and you're looking after it. The second life is when the tree is in your house and it's looking after you. That also lasts about 30 years, during which time you've planted a new set of trees. They'll be harvested and they'll replace the old timbers that are beginning to go rotten perhaps by that stage. And th so that way you've got a, a, a perfect interlocking of tree lasting and human lasting, that is tree life cycles and human life cycles that are kind of in phase with one another and carrying on indefinitely um, through time. That was all fine until the conservationists came along and said you can't cut those trees. These trees are part of nature, we need to preserve nature. So they denied the trees the possibility of their second life. They just stood there, getting older and older in the ground until they eventually, drew, sort of, um, as conifers do, sort of died on their, died on their legs, um, died on their roots and became dead trees standing in the ground. And the foresters didn't have the raw materials to build and re restore their houses. So what happens now is we have ancient trees and concrete houses. Uh, in the name of uh, preservation and thinking of sustainability in terms of the preservation of form rather than the continuation of, of life cycles. So that, that's what I mean in terms that, 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 that if we, we compare a way of thinking that the, of, of the world which the Japanese forest has had as something that is, is in movement, that, that, that is continually evolving over time, or whether we think of the world as some sort of steady state. Um, so what that example reveals, I think, is a difference in ways of thinking about the future. Uh, and of course, that's precisely what sustainability is about. How do we, how do we think of the future? And one way, uh, which um, in this case one would associate with the conservationists, is in terms of projection, and the other way is in terms of anticipation. One way to think about the future is, as in many climate change scenarios, and what will the world, we try to think, what will the world be like in 2050 or 2100? So we're trying to project the future, project what we do, what, what we want, what we don't want, and try and take steps that will produce the kind of future we want. That is, that is thinking about the future in terms of projection. Thinking about the future in terms of anticipation, as again John Ruskin put it, is not about predicting the future, but about knowing the ways things are going, being able to be, be sensitive enough to one's surroundings to see, to have a sense of the ways in which things are going, and then perhaps enter into those ways and modify them, bend them this way and that to suit your purposes, but not to project or impose uh, an anticipated, or sorry, a projected future state imagined in the present. Um, so again, I would want to say that with the sustainability of everything, sustainability has to be about anticipation, not about projection. 
in terms of that distinction. Now, I just wanted to uh, finish with uh, a few words about what the implications of this notion of the sustainability of everything would be, on firstly, for uh, science and art, secondly, for democracy and citizenship, and thirdly, for peace and friendship. Um, so far as science, I mean, these are big issues, and I can only just, just touch on them, but, but so far as science and art is concerned, um, it's a quite personal thing for me because um, I started off very much, well, I actually started off as a natural scientist and before moving into anthropology, and so I started off in a from very science-based approach and, and now find myself talking mostly to artists and in many ways feeling deeply uneasy about the present state of, of, uh, of the scientific project. And what strikes me is that um, the, it, that that in many ways um, science, and particularly the science of ecology, has lost its original sense of environmental sustainability, environmental responsibility, and that and at art, environmental art in particular, has taken on that um, responsibility that science has lost. In other words, that if, that if you think, who are the, who are the people who are really um, arguing for some form of environmental sustainability? Um, it's not the scientists, but the artists. And this, this is something that's happened, I think, over the last two or three decades. Um, and I've been rather curious as to understand what, what exactly has happened to science. Uh, and, and I do f f worry that, and particularly fueled by the, by the digital revolution, science has, well, it's, not, it's very hard to generalize about science. It's such a big thing and so messy and full of so many different approaches. But, but mainstream science, it, anyway, the, the mainstream science that has the big funding, seems to have turned into some immense data processing exercise in which living beings, including us, human beings, have more or less disappeared. It, it, it often seems that, that, that global science, in, in collusion with the, the multinational corporations that it more and more serves, treats the rest of the world, that is, including the vast majority of its increasingly impoverished and apparently disposable human population, as standing reserves of data to feed the insatiable demands of the knowledge economy. Uh, so I, I feel in many ways that, that, that science has reneged on its um, original uh, environmental sensibility uh, and, and, and has left art, in some senses, to pick up the pieces. <coughs> the implications for democracy and citizenship are, I think, that we do have to find a different way of, of, of thinking about, well, what these are. That we, we have to realize that sustainable citizenship is not some sort of a priori entitlement, as though you're a citizen of your country or of the world simply by virtue of the fact that you were born in a particular place and then you just got it along with your passport and your birth certificate and everything else. But it's something you, you actually have to work at, and that this work involves a process of what I, I want to call commoning. And by commoning, I don't mean working back to find, oh, what is it that all human beings have in common? What is this human nature? Maybe we can use what we all have in common as a baseline on which to build a democracy. It is rather to suppose that actually we're all different, and that each of us speaks with our own particular voice. And we are different because we are part of this life process because it's that process that, that generates difference. But at the same time, we are committed to getting along together. And getting along together means not looking back to see what we have in common, but looking forward to see how through a stretch of imagination, I can begin to see how my experience can join with and respond to yours so that we can, so to speak, get along together. 
Um, and that, that's, that's a different sense of, of, of democracy. It's not thinking of democracy in terms of the identity of interests. It's thinking of democracy in terms of the, the differentiation and commoning of life trajectories. So uh, I think what, what we need then is a politics of difference rather than a politics of identity, not trying to gang together on the basis of common interests, but to recognize difference, celebrate it, and show how, because we are different, we can actually work together. Because in the end, um, similarity divides us like beans in a sack, but difference is what brings us together. And the implications for peace and friendship, well, we have to go back to the etymology of the word harmony. I mentioned earlier that for, for Greeks, for the ancient Greeks who developed the term harmony, one of the epitomes of harmony was the, was the, was the rope with its twists in opposite directions which hold it together and recognize that harmony includes tension and agonism as well as resolution and uh, sorry, as, as, as well as um, resolution and conviviality. But it's the tension of differentiation, as for example the knots of the tree, that hold, hold things together. So we actually need tension, we need agonism, we need what we might sometimes call conflict in order to, to create a world in which we can carry on together. The inf the top-down enforcing of common interests or the trying to pretend that we're all the same is not going to produce uh, a, a, a coherent um, form of sustainability. And that's what I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the talk, or should I say the poetry? We've got about half an hour for questions and comments. So, um, <coughs> uh, my name is Brian Hill. First of all, let me thank you for a truly fascinating, interesting talk. As a classicist, ex Latin teacher, does my heart good hear you uh, uh, quote Lucretius? <laughs> and as I say on the Russian choir, I mean, what I like to be to harmonia. As a great teacher, I'm great with you in terms of harmonia and the need for tension. Eris pater pantone. Strife is the father of all things. The Greek said it. We need opposition. So, but, 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 <laughs> I am standing here numb because we are ignoring the one big elephant in the room. We assume we have a future. But while we're in this room talking, there's a young man sitting at a console waiting to press a button which will bring every dream, every hope, every life form to a blinding end in a terminal nuclear event. We, the old Simon Garfunkel song says, we continue to continue to pretend that life will never end and the flowers never bend in the rainfall. I find that unendurable. Mm. The that I do, 25 miles, the biggest dump weapons of mass extermination in Europe, is an anguish to me, which I cannot endure. And we're maybe just wagging our tongues if we're talking about sustainability, where we hold ourselves ready, as Theresa May said, not only to kill untold millions of our fellow human beings, ignoring all human life, to put an end to the whole the reverse genesis. That's what we're poised to do. And why we're poised to do that? Sustainability is very much to me. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to be what that I am, being I don't know, being honest or being pessimistic or but that's it. It's either me or us a human being and either we either we have a future without threats of mutual destruction and global extermination, or we have no future at all. That's our choice. I give you life and death, uh, blessings and a curse. It's the first promise in the book of Genesis. 
first author, the efforts whose life that you and your children may live. How oh, it would like to go on. Thank you. I don't know if that was a question. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a question. I, mean, I don't know. I, I couldn't possibly answer it either. I mean, um, I'm not Do you sure. not feel, so you not feel that like all your valuable effort and awesome scholarship is going to be blown away in a second of insanity? Mm, 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 mm. But I, I think, I, th I think, I know, I know I understand entirely what you're saying, but I, th I think. Well, this is a question about hope, uh, and, um, and, 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 and the question what we can do, because it's, it, it won't help anybody to be fatalistic, uh, and it won't, hope anybody, it won't help anybody to lose hope. So we, 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 the, the risks of, 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 of a global catastrophe, whatever form it takes, whether it's a nuclear holocaust, or a, or a climatic um, total disaster, or um, or the extermination of the bee population, and a food crisis, whatever it is, um, uh, we we have to recognise that. Um, I suppose that these possibilities are there. Um, other things could happen. There could be a a, a, a you know, Yellowstone might blow up. There could be a a, a, a caldera, um, which has got nothing whatever to do with us. Um, but could nevertheless render the the earth uninhabitable um, for 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 and that that could happen um, any time. Um, what what do we do in those circumstances? In a way, it's not a question of of, of just shutting our minds out and saying, well, we just don't think about it. But but um, it it doesn't help. I think I think we 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 we've got to how to put it. We've got to be hopeful, uh, and and we've got to be hopeful for because otherwise it's not fair on our children. It's 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 not fair on our children to um, tell them every day. Actually, the world that we're passing on to you is going to blow up. And, and, and you're all going to be dead, or you're going to have miserable lives. We, with the, surely it's our responsibility to, to our next generations to, um, to invest as much hope in them as we can. Uh, and I think, so, so in that sense, I, I would, I, th I think that's what, yes. I'm certainly believe you. We should surely the difference between natural events like asteroids hitting the air, or cold lakes, and we can do nothing about natural <coughs> events. And human rights actions. Well, yes and no. I mean, many things happen as well. Climate change. Yeah. There are even better than I do. Quite hundreds of things happen. The one immediate threat is self-imposed destruction by the use of nuclear weapons. That's the immediate threat. Leaning up to me says, talk. Yes. I mean, yeah. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. They thought that uh, mm. in Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki, you know, doing things that's like we are doing right now, but it happened. Mm. That's why we will not be pre warning. Now, of course, I must cling to hope. It's all I have. I cling to hope that everything is going, including the hope. Mm. Mm. I cling to a book beyond mm. hope. But I cannot cut count to sorry. Mm. Human and ghost destruction. But the thing the is, planet. the thing is, you see, that that there are there are parts of the world. You know, it, we don't often realise this, but but some of the most polluted and now, because of pollution, uninhabitable parts of the planet are in the far north. Um, the, I think the most polluted part of the planet is the Kola Peninsula, uh, which is now used to be inhabited by, by Sami people um, and, and some others. Um, m most of it is now uh, uninhabitable because of uh, the extraction of heavy metals and nuclear weapons testing, um, mostly during the, the 19. 50s, uh, and um, it's going to take thousands of years before that environment, which looks like an unspoiled wilderness, actually, um, it's it's impossible to live there. Um, it, it's going to take th thousands of years before um, that is inhabitable inhab again. So, for the people who, 
for whom that was their homeland, this catastrophe that you're worrying about has already happened. And, and in a sense they're living in the aftermath of it. Um, and, and across the world, uh, a, lot of, a, lot, a lot of people are living in, in those sorts of circumstances. Think of Bhopal. And think, of, think of some of these industrial disasters that have, uh, have, have already um, c killed large numbers of people, well, quite apart from Nagasaki and Hiroshima, uh, which was, was, was through armed conflict. So, so in a way, um, you know, the, 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 what, what, what strikes me as the, the really intractable problem is, is how one can um, deal with those parts of the earth which have already been rendered um, uninhabitable for very large, very long periods of time. Um, after all, there's a record of weapons testing in the, in the Pacific Islands in the, in the 1950s when nobody really understood just how harmful radiation was. I have met people from the Marshall Islands. I'm sorry. We're getting back to six dead babies. Well, this is the fucking dead babies. Her community was benefited by 60 deaths. Well, you, know, you know that the island was called Bikini. Ha ha! He, two places called bisexual, he means two, and uh, it's exploded as hot. So that's why the bikini is called a bikini, because it's hot and sexy and it's two. Other people have different Yes, I know. Yeah. And but what, do I, say, what do I say to this woman? We see this kind of community, one in four David are promoting the form because of testing we did. Mm. And this is not the frozen loss. No, no, but, it, but the but point is this has happened already. It's Can happened. I quickly move this on? We have time for discussion after um, the over tea and coffee and hopefully soup. So. I think, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, so we just have a few more questions. Do you think it is better then to cut down the trees, build the houses, and replant them, and set Yes. Yeah, I do. I, I mean, if, I, I think that, um, that there's no... Uh, yes, I do. I mean, be, be, because that, that, that way, you, you've got a system that, that, that can, can in, at least in principle, carry on as long as you like. Yes. Sorry? Here, the question. Oh. Just said it's better to cut down the trees, use it to build houses, and replant them so it keeps going instead of preserving them for thousands of years where they die. The real technical problem in sustainability there is that by planting a tree, you are not replacing what was there before. It's an old lesson. You can't make a forest by planting trees. That's ecology. But, 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 but. And, and sustainability, your thing of movement. Absolutely, I wanted to put a comment there. Absolutely right. Sorry, and, it's just and the it's development it's of, of an ecological earth is what it's all about. And by cutting trees and planting them, we don't do that. By growing food well, it, and agriculture, it, hmm. and we don't do it. Actually, it depends on how you do it, because, because there are... The, I'm, I'm simplifying the exaggerating. But the way it is mostly done is inadequate. That is true. But the, the way it is mostly done is by, by for, for example, in clear felling. You, know, you, 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 you clear fell an area and plough it up and then plant another lot. And, and, and the results are usually disastrous because for the trees to thrive, they, they're usually different species that are growing together and, and they depend on one another. Uh, so, so whether there's... Fungi and the fungi underneath, exactly. So if you destroy all that and, and, and monocrop with a particular variety of trees, that you, it's not going to work. But, but what, the, what these Japanese foresters were doing traditionally was, was much uh, less drastic. I mean, there'd be individual trees here and there. They would know the ones that were you know, ready. They, they would cut those in a mixed forest and, and, and replant. You're not destroying, the, uh, you're not plowing anything up. Um, you're not destroying the fungal uh, vegetation. You're not destroying the, the species diversity. In that situation, you can replant and it's okay. But it's not, not, not by clear felling and monocropping in its place that, that, that doesn't work. So it depends how you do it. Yeah, thank you for your, for your thoughts. Uh, and on this point particularly, as well as on the, on the point of the gentleman here, I have um, a comment. Um, my main concern with the, the idea of sustainability is that it takes a view of uh, a system that's 
that can go back to its original point, uh, mm -hmm. somehow like the snake that's biting yes, the snail. Yes. Yes. But the thing is that in reality things are not in, in, in this system because you can never go back to the original state but that's inside right. the system that yeah. has inputted some extra, mm -hmm. extra energy mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. 200 years for instance. <coughs> so from, all, from now on every year is going to be a different system itself. And so yes. you can, if you take the, the, the um, the view of, of this uh, cutting down trees to make your house and then planting a new tree, then you, you might not assume that the tree is going to grow because it is growing in a completely different environment. So you cannot assume from the beginning that this is uh, an attainable goal. Mm. And so my question is that if this is not possible in itself, then what alternative can we aspire to? I think, I, th I, um, I mean, just. What what you said is right, and, and, and a lot of the problem is lies in sort of engineering type systems thinking where the systems are supposed to be somehow closed and tight, and therefore predictable when when actually they're not. But um, but take the case of of, of climate, well, which I know a bit about it, climate change in in the north, um, where we know that there, that, that there, there are huge changes taking place, for example, in Greenland, and the ice is melting, new areas of land are being exposed, and so on, and, and this is forcing people who live there to make well, fairly radical adjustments to, <coughs> to, to their uh, livelihoods of, 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 of fishing and hunting and, and so on. But so far as they're concerned, they're not particularly concerned about the whole climate change thing, because their view is that... Um, that there, there never has been such a thing as a stable climate. Um, that, that if they look back through their own oral traditions and so on, there have been periods of warming, periods of cooling, there was a little ice age, there was a period after the little ice age. Um, and the critical thing was that people had the flexibility and the experience, the knowledge, to be able to respond to whatever was happening with their environment. And, and they would do that simply by using a good deal of common sense and, uh, and, 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 and knowing, knowing the place well. Uh, but and they would have never supposed that there was a, some sort of steady initial state from which things had diverged. So the notion of change, climate change, doesn't make much, much sense if you'd never thought that it was stable to begin with. But the key thing is this ability to respond. And to have that ability to respond, then people have to know, not only do people have to know their environments well, but they also have to be allowed to use that knowledge rather than being told that, oh, that's just their folk wisdom and what you really need to bring in is the scientific experts who will tell you what to do. That, that's the problem. Or, or, or that they'll then, the experts will say to the local people, you can't hunt there when people know that you can and that sort of thing. So, so it's, it's, it, it's that, um, that a, a ability to, to, to care for and respond to one's own environment that you know really well, that we have to respect. Um, and that's why I, I, I just get so fed up with, with, with big science because, and, and this, this cult of expertise. And there's nothing wrong with experts, but as long as, but as, long as we don't recognize, or suppose that, that there's some kind of global experts who come in and tell everybody else what to do, and they usually get it wrong. But anyway. Yeah. Chris at the back first. Um, sorry, I, I, I've been thinking about, about your, your description of, the, of these threads and the formation of knots. Hmm. And I think, so as, we, um, as human beings, we are where we are precisely because actually we're very good at making these knots, aren't we? I mean, in effect, our, our inventiveness we, you know, we, the, the knots happen in the world, the, the things exist in the world, but actually we invent new knots, in a sense. All our technology, all, you know, the house is, is, is a knot in your terms. It's a, it's a, it's a, and we didn't, so we're, we're actually constructing the knots ourselves, and, and we have this problem, which is if we can imagine a knot, we do it. Don't we? I mean, no, I mean, really seriously, it comes back to what the gentleman started with at the beginning, and I don't want to get back into that. But it is literally because, you know, Oppenheimer and those people kind of knew that they were inventing a knot that they wished they could have stopped working out how to invent because they understood the horror of what they were inventing. 
And we are, we have very little ability, it seems to me, to make choices about what we invent, what not we create. And that actually at the moment, this is the single biggest challenge, is to begin to, to, to moderate our ability to make knots and to judge which ones are actually ones that are beneficial and will promote the carrying on and, and maybe just know how to not make the ones that will stop the carrying on or reduce because, I mean, they, this seems to me the absolute crux of the thing, which is what you propose is great, except that some of the knots we're making cut, completely undermine the principles that you're presenting. Yes. Okay, okay I mean, there's some truth in that, but the, but the catch in what you're saying is the we, as the who, who actually we are, because, and, and that's where the politics comes in, uh, be, be, because um, knots that some of us are creating are, are then making life impossible for other people. Uh, and and um, so, uh, or actually causing other people to be excluded. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the cl classic example of that is, um, is in um, wildlife cons conservation in so many areas of the world where people have been pushed off their land, uh, which they used to live on, uh, in order to make way for, for, for conservation of, of, of gorillas or elephants or, or whatever it might be. And, um, and, and, and so you might think that uh, the, 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 the conservationists or the, um, are, are creating knots of their own, yes, um, but, but those are knots that are also creating boundaries. Um, and and the, the, the distinction I want to make there is between, a, a knot itself doesn't have boundaries. I mean, if you think of a knot, it's got this tangle of threads and, and, and they're going off this way and that way. It's not wrapped up in itself. The problem comes that when, when, when one person's line is another person's cut. Um, so when in Namibia, the military the South African military constructed roads to take its military hardware from A to B through the Kalahari Desert, they cut through the paths of local hunter-gatherers. Um, and if they came out onto the road, they were in danger of getting shot at. So that one very powerful actor's highway is another less powerful's barrier that it's very dangerous to cross. And, and, and I think that's actually where the, where the problem comes. Maybe not in the knotting itself, but in the way in which um, one person's line can be another person's line of life, can be another person's um, wall of death. I mean, literally, sometimes. Mm. We need a set of criteria in the way that you can't create them. We don't know enough. Well, well, and, 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 and even if we did, you know, who, who, who would be able to, who, who could get up and t tell the rest of the world this is what you're supposed to do? <laughs> right? This is a real, real problem. Yes, yes. Next question. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, that was amazing. Really, really enjoyed that sense. So thank you so much. Um, I was a student at the University of Glasgow, so I've read some stuff you've written. Um, I'm just like, uh, your talk there kind of, I think everyone in the room could probably agree, like opened your mind up to think about the world that we live in a really different way. So rather than the traditional sort of Western way of thinking like the landscape is just a backdrop upon which we all carry out our day to day tasks or whatever. Um, and I know that some non Western cultures kind of um, have traits that mean that they um, relate to the world in a way that you're kind of describing just because of the way they are. So I was wondering what you think about how that kind of um, way of looking at the world can be shared to benefit the whole world and how you would imagine that could be possible because I know that what's the Western culture has done really everything. So what do you think? <laughs> well, I, I, I think that we, sh we need to learn from others and 
my own sort of little local protest, um, because I work in a university and I'm an academic and I'm an academic anthropologist, and I get annoyed by the way in which, even in my own discipline, which has a fairly good record on the whole, but still wants to collect material on other people in order ultimately to analyze them and to turn them into objects of knowledge. Um, whereas the important thing, I think, although maybe that's all right up to a point, but what we need to do is to actually learn from what people are telling us and, and, and see how what we can learn from them might help to form our thinking. Let's say in, 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 in this world, basically, we need all the help we can get. And, and therefore, we need to be prepared to listen to and learn from anybody. It doesn't mean we have to agree with them. And in fact, they might be awful people and have terrible ideas. But, but at least we need to engage with as much as possible to, to, to get some sort of sense about uh, where to go next. And, and, and to do that, I think we need a different attitude within the academy itself. So this is actually, in some sense, a, a problem for the universities. Which is something that's exercising me quite at the moment because of where we are. But the, the thing is that, that, that we have, have universities and they're at the moment, I think, have reached a crisis point uh, because across the world, universities are being taken over by corporations as basically research institutes for generating profit. Um, and, and that is manifestly unsustainable. I mean, uh, universities will either disappear or at least disappear in, 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 in any sense that we recognize them at. And, and therefore, we have to have another, we have to be clear about what the alternative is, what, what a university should be. And I think uh, in, in a world where we can no longer claim, as the academy used to claim, that as academics, as scientists, as researchers, we can deliver a superior account or an authoritative account of the way the world works. It's like we know and we can tell everybody else. In a post-colonial world, that's no longer the case. But it seems to me that the university is a place where ideas matter and where people with different ideas can meet and talk in safety and in an ecumenical spirit. And we need, to, we need institutions where that can happen. And for me, the university is that institution. So, so part of the answer to your question, I think, is how we reform the universities, or if we can't reform them, how do we build an alternative university system in its place? Next question. Mm -hmm. ah, thank you. Um, it's, I find your talk very, very hopeful and particularly the analogies with the connections. My only question is about the way that science is going, because I think there is hope there at <coughs> the sidelines, particularly in the, in the case of natural philosophy mm. and the Tao of physics, and where they're coming together with the, um, the, the Buddhist and the yeah. um, Tibetan um, understanding and I think that is on the horizon is really hopeful mm. and I, it's bringing together those ideas mm, mm, and that we change and we all become much more aware of these connections of space and time mm. and I think that will change us. I hope there is hope in science I mean, it, it, and, and what you say is true and I have no problem with Individual scientists, who are any most any of the scientists I know, they're they're wonderful people and thoughtful people, and considerate and caring people. The problem is almost entirely with with the institutionalization of science, and and there are, and it's almost as though the, the the scientists I talk to say, of course I agree with everything you say, but how am I going to get my papers published, and how am I going to get my job? unless I do what is expected, uh, publish in this kind of way, collect my data in that kind of way, do this experiment. I know it, I know it's, they, they say, I know it's wrong. Right? So, I know it's unethical. I know it, it, you know, it, that it's all fabrication, but 
No, that's... They, they find themselves... I mean, actually, the reason why I jumped ship from science was because I found the whole institutional, institutional machine so constricting and so rigid and so opposed, actually, to real thinking that I, I thought this is not the place for me to work in. So, so um, there, 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 there is perhaps, a, a, I think, an increasing disjunction between, between institutionalized mainstream science and what many scientists themselves are doing and thinking. And I find that scientists I talk to are themselves deeply concerned about that. They, at least they find it a source of a very considerable frustration and, and often talk to me as they're, they're envious. They say, you know, if only we could have the freedom that you have in anthropology to think in, in, in ways that are different from required patterns. And, and in, I mean, a, a, just a case in point of that in, in, in biology is, is um, there, there is this tradition of Goethean science that goes back to the ideas of Goethe and how one should study plants by, by really getting to know them very deeply. And, and the way in which that is treated by mainstream science is, is, is utterly appalling. I mean, it, and that, that, it, that, that, that it blows apart the, the, um, the myth that science is an open system of knowledge. Uh, the, 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 and, and, and there have been other traditions where, where you know, mainstream science has virtually come to book burning and saying we, we, we won't allow any of this nonsense. Uh, so, so, so we have this curious situation in which, in which, uh, in which science in principle is a, is a, is a, uh, is a very open-ended enterprise, but where because of the way it's been taken up where, where, perhaps because of the way it's been tied to the ambitions of the state, it's become very rigid in its structures, I think. But there's hope. Yeah, there's always hope. Yeah. So, we've got the last question before we need to wrap up. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I'll try to make this hopeful. Um, yeah, I guess because I'm coming more from the art world, I don't think it's your, your um, point of view is very much grass is always greener. And I would say that the problems exist in the art world as much as they exist the problem, in yeah. science. Mm -hmm. And that actually the only people who are kind of doing anything with any integrity or able to speak the truth are always on the fringes mm -hmm. of, the, of the art world and the science world. So is it going to... And this probably echoes the, the questions of the two women behind me, but how do we shift those conversations into the mainstream? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know, but, 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 but um, perhaps strategically, we shouldn't even be trying to get into the mainstream. I sometimes wonder... So I think, think about my own discipline of anthropology, which is, which is sort of, by most accounts, a bit marginal, um, uh, or regarded as a bit, bit, bit way out compared with, with, with mainstream subjects. Um, and people sometimes say, you know, if only anthropology had the clout, the power, the numbers, the funding, the popular appeal of a, some, a discipline like psychology. I believe there are more psychologists in psychology than there are practitioners of any other discipline. It's enormous. And then you think, would you really want anthropology to become like that? What would, would, would you act, would actually want this subject to become mainstream? And, and I think, no, probably not, because it would become normalized, uh, it would lose its critical edge. So maybe, I, I, I just don't know how to answer it, but, but, but maybe that's the wrong ambition to say, I want to be mainstream. Um, and that the right ambition is to think, I want to change the world and leave it at that. And not worry about whether you're on the margins or on the mainstream. And then see, once the world's changed where you've landed up. 
<laughs> uh, but I appreciate the difficulty and, and, and uh, you know, uh, people are compromised on both sides of the art science fence. But I am struck by, by the extent to which there's really some really good, challenging, interrogating work that's going on in sort of like the environmental arts or however you want to categorize them. Um, much more now than 30 years ago. And I'm struck at the same time by how the sort of ecology that was really strong in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, which was field ecology mostly, with people working very closely with certain landscapes, environments, animals, uh, how that has become sidelined in current bioscience that the two things seem to be somehow, well, they've happened at the same time and they seem to be somehow connected. Thank you very okay. much. Um,